Hello, I'm Robin Vincent, and in a break in the weather, it's time to check out what's warm and cozy in the world of computer music technology in October's Molten Music Monthly. We're checking out what was fab about Roland's 909 day. Spectrotronics have a shed load of pianos to share. There's an ultimate audio interface from Focusrite. Weird sort of vocal noises from Juicy. Ju Juicy. Isotopes Neutron is gonna do all our mixing for us. D16 conjure up some weird and interesting vintage delays with some strange bloke. Behringer get their deep mind all augmented. The Keith McMillan K-Mix finally gets Windows drivers and Tim Exile tells us to take it slow with the longest of long reverbs. But first, I'm going to introduce you to a new thing. Another new thing. I know what you're saying. You don't have time to do the first thing you want to do. So how could I possibly be cramming in a new thing? Well, I don't know. I'm just kind of always full of ideas <laughs> that I'm just not actually able to deliver on. But anyway, I'm going to give this a go because I have been sort of seriously bitten by the modular bug. Now when you hear that, half of you are going to go, oh really, that's really interesting. And the other half are going to go, oh god, it's just, it's just everywhere, this modular stuff. I couldn't be less interested. Well, you know, I'm the sort of person who just likes kind of cool and groovy stuff and, and this is really coming across to me as being a bit cool and groovy and so I'm going to have an exploration into it. I'm going to take a journey into it. I've already dabbled, I've already poked around, but I think that I would like to get in a bit deeper and find out what it's all about. And I get the impression that there's a lot of people out there who are in a similar position where the world of modular synthesis, all that beeping, all those lights flashing, all those noises and sounds and the sculpting that goes on seems really interesting and attractive and a world that you'd really like to get into, but it's hard. It's hard to make that first step. How do you even begin? Where do you start? What do you have to get? Is there an easy way in? So that's where I am. I'm right at that place where I'm about to take the step into this larger world and I want to, to try to do it right. And as I'm doing this, because it's for my benefit, it's what I want to do. You know, it's not for some kind of publicity stunt or to improve your life necessarily. It's interesting to me and I figure that because I like doing videos and I like talking about this stuff and people seem to appreciate the way that I do that that I'm going to document it. I might write some blogs, I might do some videos. They're not going to be every week, it's going to be a little bit stretched out because there's only so much you can do and also it's mind-numbingly expensive so I have to be cautious and have to take small steps. So anyway, if modular is something that's interesting to you then the blogs will appear on the same Molten Music Tech dot com blog as these do and the videos will be dropped into the same YouTube channel so keep an eye out for those and come with me on this journey into modular synthesis it's not just going to be about the hardware there will be software related stuff as well and also something that's quite important to me is that I'm really interested in how it integrates with computers how it integrates with your door I know there's a huge emphasis on modular to go stepping out into hardware only and to leave the computer behind but that's not where I am that's not what I want to do I'm much more of a fan of getting hold of everything I want everything I want computers I want software plugins and I want hardware and I want hardware synthesis software synthesis I want everything running through each other and affecting each other and creating a whole mess together that's the plan so yeah come with me on that journey I think that's that's going to be interesting Right, moving on. Roland 909 day. Well, that was kind of a big fuss over nothing, really. I mean, there was a lot of products. Uh, there was accordions and drum things, guitar effects, uh, some cabinets. And there was, of course, a little bunch of synths, but there was nothing really staggeringly interesting. There was a new updated 909 and a, a 303, you know, so you've got those classic drum sounds in a nice boutique shaped box and you've got the classic bass line, which is great. I mean, I've, I've always loved it in Propellerhead's Rebirth from, from way back. It's a great little sound. It's got a special particular sound to it, which is great, but I, I don't think I'm gonna buy one. It's not that interesting. 
to me. I don't think it has a particular sound. Same with the 909. I mean, you get 909 kits in everything. But of course, this is a genuine. Or is it? Because it's actually analog model circuitry. It's, it's Roland's sort of digital version of their analog stuff. I mean, it sounds awesome. Don't get me wrong. It sounds perfect. But I don't know. It's, it just doesn't really float my boat particularly. Now, the one thing that perhaps did is the System 8, the big synth, the big brother of the System 1. I mean, it's, it's a proper looking synthesizer with all the knobs and the glorious things going on, but it's still sort of modeled circuitry. It's still preset driven. It's still, you know, the knobs aren't exactly going to tell you exactly what's going on because uh, you can switch things internally. You can mess it around and synthesize internally. So it's a great synth, but it's not really interesting to me at the moment. It's interesting, it's good. I love the way it actually it can become a Jupiter 8 and it can become a Juno 106 through their plug out technology where you kind of, it's like swapping another chip inside so it now does a whole bunch of new sounds. That is really interesting and that does give it, I think, more than you would normally find in any other synth. But it's still in that horrible green and it sounds all right. So yeah, it's good, but Again, not much in the way of computer technology, really. So, ultimately, 909 Day was some great toys for people who have yearned for these things all their lives, but for the rest of us, I think we should move on. A couple of months ago, I wrote an article on the top five virtual electric pianos. And at the times, I think the Waves one had just come out, and so I dug, dug around finding other ones. There's an Arturia one, there's one uh, from Cinematic Instruments that I really like, and other bits and pieces. Because I, I love, I absolutely adore the Fender Rhodes sound, and I use it a lot in a lot of my music. And that tinkly tangly, that wobble, that, that sort of Celeste and music box sound at the top. I mean, probably my most favourite piece of music ever created was Riders of the Storm by The Doors, which has that lovely it's beautiful, along with the piano bass going on. Sublime. So what am I talking about? Oh yeah, so, uh, so just after I did the top five, there seemed to be a whole cascade of new sampled virtual electric pianos that just came pouring out of everywhere. Everybody did one. Uh, Spitfire Audio did one. Waves, of course, I just mentioned. E-Instruments did one. And now Spectrosonics have got in the act. And not just one piano. They haven't sampled one piano. They've sampled 36. Sort of 36 weird, crusty, old, crappy keyboards that they found somewhere. In fact, I think probably it's one guy who has a Fender Rhodes and he's hawking it around to all these different sample companies. And they're all going, wow, it's the best thing we've ever heard. And they all do these individual massive painstaking sample processes on them and release all the same instrument at the end of the day. I don't know, that might be how it is. But you know, can we have enough electric pianos? I don't know. And they all sound fabulous. I mean, they all claim to have sampled the soul, the very nature of the instrument and put that in digital form. But well, they, they just all sound really good. So I don't think we can really lose. I mean, one thing that the Waves one did when that came in was that it had a price point. I think it was $60. I forget now, it might, be, it might have been $40, but it sort of undercut the Arturia one by hundreds of dollars, which was amazing. So we are now getting access to extraordinarily sampled instruments at a really good price. So it's definitely worthwhile checking those out. The Spectrosonics one is called Keyscape. Well, because there's so many, I suppose. But it's the first thing they've done for donkey's years. So they've worked on it really, really hard. You can probably tell. So if you're interested in you know, a, a bunch of esoteric electric pianos, along with the classic suitcase, the classic uh, stage piano, then, then definitely check that out. If you don't have any idea as to what you want to record or how to plug something in, then probably the Focusrite Red 8 Pre is going to be right up your alley. Now, I'm just really sort of being facetious, but it has a whole stack of different sort of plugs. I mean, it's a Thunderbolt 2 interface, 64 channels. You've got uh, an Ethernet connection for Dante. You've got these mini ports for Avid HDX hardware. You've got ADAT. You've got D subs on the back for microphones. Whoever knows how to plug those in, I have no idea. So it essentially has 
everything. You can plug everything in it. You don't have to make your decision now. You can buy the interface and then say, well, I don't know, I might get into Dante uh, Ethernet type stuff, I don't know, or I might just plug it all in analog, or, oh, I don't know, I might plug in a Pro Tools system, or, I don't know, maybe ADAT is the way to go. So it's a sort of interface that can, can, can prevent you from making any decisions at all. So it's an awesome Focusrite new interface. It looks amazing. The front panel on it, or the little screen that's showing all the stuff, looks amazing. You do have two instrument inputs on the front, which is kind of odd considering everything else that it has, but that's very handy because there is nowhere else you can just plug something in. Everything else has to be kind of loomed in with these uh, really annoying D-sub things on the back. I'm sure there's a simple way to connect them in because it has mic preamps built in, so it's not suggesting that you buy something like the the Octopree from, from RME, which has got all these mic preamps, which then give you a D-sub out to go into something else. No, 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 this already has mic preamps built in. So you're gonna want a loom which has microphone inputs on it so you can brute those directly into the box and then use the awesome mic preamp technology that's inside. So Focusrite are very much billing this as their ultimate interface. Well, because it can plug everything in and it does look and probably sounds amazing. The only downside is that Focusrite's development on Windows for Thunderbolt has really stalled at the moment. The Claret range, there's still no sign of a driver for that. And that seems to be quite common in the industry at the moment, which is a real shame. I mean, there's all those Apollo uh, interfaces from UAD and there's the Apogee ones that have come out recently. They're all Mac only. And yet Microsoft keep telling us that Thunderbolt is fine and groovy on Windows. So I don't know, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know where the problem lies. And, uh, and that's a shame. So at the moment, the Focusrite Red 8 Pre is Mac only. Ooh. Many years ago, there was a virtual instrument called the Delay Llama, and it was an awesome little, I think it was a college project by a group of people who called themselves Audio Nerds and you play the keyboard and it made these da, uh, oh, uh, 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 sort of singing noises and, and it was brilliant. It was just a, a, a kind of a, a glorious thing that always made people smile. Well, this appears to have been resurrected in a brand new virtual instrument plug-in thing called Jussie, Jussie, Juicy, Jussie. I don't know how you pronounce it. I don't really care. It's designed to emulate the vowels of the male voice. It looks really interesting as well. I like the fact that the, the GUI for it is kind of like a scrappy old piece of blotting paper that's had some paint spilled on it, kind of. And it's all sort of handwritten and, and looks a bit very, very lo-fi. So the, the interface itself is really quite aesthetically pleasing. And the sound, yeah, I mean, it's head and shoulders above the Delay Llama, but it just, it just brings up all those memories for me and that's, uh, and that's quite pleasing. So I, yeah, I like that. And it sounds, kind of brilliant but in that sort of not sure how on earth this is ever going to be used seriously sort of kind of way but go try it out it's not expensive and it certainly brings a different sound to your music while they've only gone and done it I mean it was inevitable really Isotope have invented Automix they're calling it Neutron and they go to great lengths and pains to explain that there's no way that this is mixing for you. There's absolutely no possibility of taking mixing and sound choice decisions out of human hands. No, 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 no. This is purely an assistant, something to suggest EQ settings, something that might recommend the compression values and the saturation perhaps and the ex and maybe use how to use some transients and exciters in order to sculpt out the instrument sound so that everything sounds a heck of a lot better. Yeah, yeah, this is one of those assistants that's kind of an annoying know-it-all that you just want to slap and say, go and make the tea, rather than being right all the time about my mixing decisions. So, so yeah, it, it doesn't automatically mix, it just suggests this is what you should do. And of course, you should do it. It's like, you know, shut up, Isotope, take my money and just make my music sound good. Thank you. But this, you know, this is the step. I mean, it's something which has been coming for a long time, I think. I don't see why, with the technology that we have these days, that you cannot analyse a multi-track piece of music and suggest the best sonic arrangement for all of these parts. I mean, it's only maths at the end of the day. It's only frequencies. 
you know, pitches and tones. So surely an analysis of that could provide the most pleasing way to arrange those things. So that's kind of what this does, I think. It certainly has a nice big fat EQ on the front and is suggesting nodes for it and how you can make each individual instrument stand out and stand better in the frequency range and the dynamic range. I mean, that's its key, I think, really, and then adding some compression and saturation in order to, to beef up certain bits. I mean, is it now taking mixing decisions out of your hands? Yeah, I think if you let it, certainly. Is that a bad thing? Oh, I don't know. I think a lot of engineers are very precious about these things, and I, I'm, I'm unconvinced about how much difference the that our ears and our experience really makes. I mean, for me, where experience counts is in understanding the gear, understanding the signal flow, and how to get the best out of the equipment that you have. That's where the experience really lies. A lot of the EQing that people do, a lot of those finishing off type of things are the same. People are always gonna EQ a bass in the same way or a guitar in the same way. And so having a piece of software that does that for you perhaps is really helpful to those of us who aren't able to employ a really experienced person. Or it might even be useful just as a time-saving device for people who are doing it all the time. I don't know. But it's certainly, I think we're gonna see more of this. We're gonna see more uh, plugins which are essentially suggesting or making mixing decisions for you. And for me, that's okay. That's all right. All my energy personally goes into the creation of the music in the first place. The tweaking and the fiddling at the end actually starts getting right up my nose. So something which is going to help me with that is going to improve my choices and perhaps stop me fiddling with things. Yeah, that sounds like a really good idea to me. Anyway, it's only about 150 quid, which is not bad. It's also in a bundle that they're doing with a stack load of other isotope stuff for 369 at the moment, which is probably a bit of a bargain. But anyway, that's probably the most interesting thing uh, this month, so go check it out. The Kmix, at last, there are Windows drivers. Oh, I've been waiting forever. I've seen this thing, it's been a knocking around a place for a good year, if not two years. And it's always looked really interesting. Ah, oh, this could be just the thing I'm after. Something which is, because really what I need, because I'm expanding out into more external hardware, I need a mixer. But I don't really want a mixer because they tend to be these huge things that sit on your desk and get in the way. And I don't want to be getting into all that EQ and I don't want it with built-in effects and all that sort of thing. I just want something simple that I can plug my stuff into that I can have a little bit of control over that goes into and out of my computer. I don't want a 1U rack either. I don't have anywhere to put a 1U rack, a 1U rack audio interface. I don't know where it's supposed to go. I would much rather have something that's accessible on my desktop that I can use but is not huge. K-Mix seem to really fit the bill. And so I'm very excited about it. I have one, it's in the shed. It's, I've already used it live, I've already used it um, for making music and it's really doing the job. I'm gonna do a full and in-depth review, getting right down into how the latency works, how the interface works, all the ins and outs, whether that white stuff is good or not. I don't know, white spongy stuff you're moving about. We shall see. So look out for that, coming very soon. That's gonna be my next project after the one I'm currently in the middle of, I think. Uh, but ultimately, it's an audio interface with uh, eight ins and outs and spongy, strange, touchy bee fader thingies on the front. Uh, D16 do great stuff. I love their plugins. They're always of a uh, high quality. The GUIs are amazing, uh, easy to use, and do kind of what they say on the tin. They're really good, straightforward, creative bits of software. So I am always interested when something new comes along, but it's that slimy Stephen Slate guy. I don't know what it is about him. It just, it just makes my skin crawl. It's like something really creepy and oozy about him. And what is he looking at? What is it that's over there that he's looking at? Why is he looking over there? What is it? What are you seeing, Stephen? Is it some kind of acid flashback? We just don't know. We just don't know. Anyway, I struggle to believe anything this man says, unfortunately, which is a shame because D16 produced some excellent plugins. And I have no doubt that the delay plugin that they are flogging here 
is going to be excellent and I'm really looking forward to it. However, you know, I've got to get, I've got, I've got to get around this strange personality which I don't think does them any favours. However, the other thing I'm not very sure about is how you actually buy this plugin because it's not available yet and it's certainly not available on their website but it seems to be coming part of the Slate Digital subscription package, which means you've got to pay them like $14 a month forever to continue using the plugin. But we don't know yet. Hopefully it'll be available as a standalone because I don't really want to buy into the whole Slate thing. Thanks very much. It's nothing personal, except it's really personal. I don't know, is it? Anyway, I think I need to go and have a wash. I was at the Synthfest in Sheffield when Behringer unveiled their augmented reality interface for the DeepMind 12 synthesizer. I kind of ignored it. I mean, I saw it there. I, I saw the HoloLens Microsoft helmet thingies and I picked them up and pushed them about. I played around on the DeepMind 12 as well. And then I chatted with the engineers and they sort of gave me the impression that the whole HoloLens thing was just something they were playing with. They were toying with it and seeing if anybody thought it was interesting when in actual fact they had developed an entire interface to go with the DeepMind 12 that I was completely oblivious to. However when I saw people using it and messing around it was kind of exactly as I imagined it would be. It's all this arm achy stuff of trying to move. I'm going to, to grab a menu. I'm going to grab a menu. Grab a me pump menu and then I'm going to move a slider. Oh, my arms ache, my arms ache. Oh, it's going to go over there. Oh, it's going to go. Oh, I turn this thing over here. I don't know. I mean, we're not all Tom Cruise from Minority Report with rippling muscles and able to hold our arms up like this all the time in order to interact with an augmented reality. It's just difficult. I mean, what do they have? They had a few menus and things that you could move. They had a kind of a virtual keyboard. You can go bing, bing, bing. But you've got a real flipping keyboard here, why not use the real keyboard rather than the virtual keyboard that's going to make your arms ache? Uh, I mean, I don't know. They had a laser harp thing. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of cool, I suppose. Um, and it did open up and display a lot of stuff that you cannot see on the tiny screen on the DeepMind 12. So there was advantages. There was something there. There was something worthwhile in it, I'm pretty sure. I mean, in the demos and the people talking about their experience of the demos afterwards, it sounds awesome. I don't think that it is awesome. I don't think the HoloLens is awesome. I think it's interesting. I think it has potential for some things, but I'm still yet to see a killer application for it. In fact, the Behringer thing is probably the best thing, the best use of this technology that I've seen. So. I don't know. I mean, the, the Midas guys, the engineers there, they were enthusiastic and very upbeat about it. And so they're obviously having a good time trying to work out the best way to use this technology. And it is kind of exciting, but also it's a 4,000 pound slab of stuff weighing heavily on your head that's trying to pull you over and you're waving at it. And that's a helicopter. I don't know. I mean, I, I played with one about a year ago at the Microsoft party last year and it was uncomfortable. I didn't really know what was happening. And, uh, well, I was very drunk. But it didn't come across to me at that time as something particularly useful. Groundbreaking, definitely. Potentially awesome. But at the moment, I don't know, we're still waiting to see, really. So I remain unconvinced by that whole thing. Um, however, playing on the DeepMind 12 was all right. It was quite good fun, as synths go. Slow is a beautiful effect created by Tim Exile, who also created uh, Flesh and some other effects and bits and pieces for Native Instruments Reactor. This is a, is a reverb that just has the longest tails you could possibly imagine. It goes on, or can go on, forever. It's like packed full of lots of little delays and reflections and diffusion, which can create this amazing sort of sound wash. Uh, just from some simple sounds being put in at one end. I mean, you can reduce it down to being kind of a simple delay, but ultimately its, it's beauty is in this sort of rain and wash and sort of ocean of sound that emanates from whatever it is you're running through it. It's just 
beautiful. It's simply lovely. I'm really liking it. It's also free, which is awesome. All you gotta do is sign up to Tim's newsletter and you can use it for free, providing you have Reactor 6, which is what it runs in. So here, running at the moment, over here, is me running my Moog Mother 32 straight through it. Uh, and you can hear the sort of sound that it creates as I mess around with the different parameters. So I'm gonna leave that running as we work towards the end of this month's Molten Music Monthly. So while that's playing along and while we're all chilling out to that, I'd just like to remind you of my new series of Surface Pro 4 videos, which are just off the cuff and as quick as I can to show you what I'm doing at that particular moment. And I'm gonna go off and do one shortly as it's just started to rain again. And coming soon is my roundup review of different bits of multi-touch MIDI control software like Yeko and YMIDI and Emulator. Putting that together now. Also, please check out our new range of audio PCs called the Audio PC that are now available on multimusictechnology.co.uk. So if you need an audio PC, then why not check out the Audio PC? Yeah, do you see what I've done there? Yeah, that's quite good. And in the meantime, whatever happens, wherever you are, go make some tunes. <laughs>